like this school, the Spanish language and Latino cultures aren't something that are just on the side. They're very much at the center of what happens here, reflecting the reality of not just this community, but the U.S. Catholic Church. Bishop Kakanis in America Magazine just argued that it drives migrants into more remote regions. Thank God I didn't get out before I changed, because I feel like I might have done the same thing again. A global church. We're a church that goes to the margins. We're a church that um, really reaches out to to all. The the church in general, and especially Catholic schools, should really dare to innovate and to try new things. Round of applause for whoever produced that video. Well, good evening. My name is Thomas Poon, and I serve as the executive vice president and provost for Loyola Marymount University. I'd like to begin this evening by saying welcome to LMU, the Jesuit University of Los Angeles. To all our faculty, staff, and students, we are glad to have you here this evening. And welcome as well to our alumni and all other guests who are joining us this evening. And a special welcome to the many joining us throughout the United States via live stream. So tonight we are going to hear about the challenges and hopes in building kinship in broken and healing communities from Father Greg Boyle. This event is part of America Media's wider initiative called the Church in America, which focuses on the future of the Catholic Church in the United States, and particularly how the issues of education, immigration, immigration and incarceration affect Latinx communities throughout the United States. As was just evidenced in the video at the beginning of this evening, LMU is proud to partner with America Media to help foster this national conversation on the challenges facing the Catholic Church and in building dialogue around the issues particularly facing the future of the church. I would like now to welcome Father Matt Malone, Editor-in-Chief of America, the Jesuit Review of Faith and Culture. Father Malone will serve as the moderator of tonight's conversation following Father Boyle's talk. Father? Thank you very much, and good evening, my brothers and sisters. Um, and it is wonderful to be here in Los Angeles. And thank you to Dr. Poon for that very warm introduction and welcome uh, to Los Angeles. America Media is really proud to be leading this uh, initiative, The Church in America. And uh, we're very grateful to uh, Dr. Schneider, the president of LMU, uh, as well as Dr. John Sebastian and his team at the Office of Mission and Ministry here for their support and for their partnership uh, throughout really what was a long day and getting ready, not just uh, to welcome you to this room, but to welcome the thousands who are watching us via live stream. Because this is truly a national conversation. And just as the church can be found in every quarter of America, the country that is, as well as the magazine, <laughs> um, so too can the issues that we are discussing in this multi-year initiative, The Church in America the issues of education uh, and of uh, immigration, as well as uh, what we will discuss tonight with Father Boyle, questions of criminal justice and rehabilitation, restoring our communities. Um, these affect all of us and are 
uh, challenges faced by every community in the United States. And they have a particular effect, uh, as we heard, on Latino and Hispanic communities, the largest and fastest growing portion of our church community in the United States, and also the first of our church communities in the United States. This is why American media has convened this national conversation about the future sustainability and growth of the church in America. Thank you all to have joined, who have joined us here tonight, and uh, both here in, in person and via the live stream, um, for helping to lead this conversation. Our speaker, our star tonight, needs uh, no introduction, but since uh, apparently in our culture you then introduce someone after saying that, uh, <laughs> it is my great pleasure to introduce my brother, uh, Greg Boyle of the Society of Jesus, who will speak about the joys and the, and the challenges of helping those who have um, been caught up in cycles of violence to rebuild their lives. Father Boyle, as you I'm sure well know, is the founder of Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, the largest gang intervention, rehabilitation, and reentry program in the world. As the pastor of Dolores Mission Church, he witnessed the devastating impact of gang violence on his community during the so-called decade of death that began in Los Angeles in the late 1980s. In 1988, he and a parish and community members started what would eventually become Homeboy Industries, which employs and trains former gang members in a range of social enterprises, as well as providing critical services to thousands of men and women who walk through its doors every year seeking a better life, a life of opportunity. He is, in the finest Jesuit tradition, a man for others, and it is my pleasure to introduce him to you this evening. Thank you very much. Um, before I start, I, I want to announce that we're, we're going to ask you to sign a letter um, afterwards thanking uh, Governor Newsom for the moratorium uh, against the death penalty. So, um, so I was happy to congratulate him the, the minute I heard, and, uh, and, and, and good for him. That was obviously. Uh, reflected the kind of God we actually have. So, uh, so you will be handed these as you leave from, by my two pals over here. Um, I'm kind of an aerial view guy. I, I kind of, uh, I don't think God, I don't think Jesus is much about, uh, for Jesus it wasn't about taking the right stand on issues. It was always about standing in the right place. I always feel like if you do that, then, then you get to where we need to go and God's dream uh, uh, comes true. I mean, I'm just privileged to be with you, with my brother Jesuit Matt, and and to be supportive of America Magazine. Uh, I, I was uh, driving home from the airport the other day uh, with two homies, and uh, and there was a homie in the back seat, and he was texting, and uh, and he said, "Ag, I, my lady just texted me, and, and she wrote L M A O, and." Uh, what does that stand for? And I couldn't believe that this geezer was telling this guy <laughs> that it stands for laugh my ass off. Uh, and he says, in, in fairness to him, he, you know, uh, been in prison for a while, so uh, he didn't know all about this texting stuff. He goes, I barely right now found out that LOL does not mean lots of love. <laughs> so, so he was telling me that his 14-year-old daughter had texted him and had... Uh, uh, said, Dad, you know, uh, we won the basketball game. And so he texted her back and wrote, WTF. <laughs> and she thought, what? And a couple days later, uh, she texted him and said, Dad, you know, I passed that math test I was so worried about. And again, he writes WTF. And so, <laughs> so um, she saw him. She says, Dad, do you know what WTF stands for? And he goes, of course I do. Why, that's fantastic. <laughs> That actually happened. It's, it sounds like a well-constructed joke, but it actually happened. So, words fail me uh, to be in this room with all of you, so WTF. You know, I, I don't know what brings you out on a Tuesday night, and 
I, I think it's, we all long for something. We want the world to look differently than it currently looks. We want God's dream to come true, which is to create a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it. And so to that end, we try to imagine with God a circle of compassion, and then we imagine that nobody is standing outside that circle. And so how do we choose together to dismantle the barriers that exclude? Which is why it's, I, I bristle a little bit at issues. You know, I always go, yeah. I, I just feel like if you, if you stand in the right place, the right things happen. If you stand at the margins, look under your feet, the margins will get erased. It's how it works. And you stand with a particularity. You stand with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless, and you stand with those whose dignity has been denied, and, and you stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. And every once in a while, you win the lottery and you get to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out. And you get to stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. And you stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. So I think if kinship happened to be our goal, we would no longer be promoting justice, we'd be celebrating it. No kinship, no peace, no kinship, no justice no kinship, no equality. It's kind of how it works. I think all those things that we long for really are byproducts of this undergirding sense that we're in this together, that we, we belong to each other. And so we go to the margins and you brace yourselves because people will accuse you of wasting your time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And you don't go to the margins to make a difference. You go to the margins because you want those voices to be heard. We think it's about making a difference, but if, it's, if you want to make a difference, then it's about you. So you go to the margins not to make a difference, but so that the folks at the margins make me different. And none of that makes any sense un unless you're anchored in, a, in the God we actually have. There's a God we've settled for, the partial God, the lesser God. I had a spiritual director many years ago who said, you know, we need a better God than the one we have. He was a Jesuit. Um, but of course he's right, because we've settled for this uh, partial God. I, I remember, you know, when Dylan Roof killed all those folks in Mother Emanuel Church, and a week later, um, family members of those who had been killed stood in front of him and, and forgave him. And there isn't anybody who heard that who didn't think for a second, wow, we're in the presence of the God we actually have. But then nine months later, when they sentenced him to die and people called it God's justice, you knew we wandered back to the God we've settled for, the lesser God, the puny God, the partial God. I don't think there's anything more consequential than to actually impact and change our world than the notion of the God we have. If it's spacious and expansive, then it'll be different. You know, the church has a choice. It can circle the wagons or it can widen the circle. But there isn't anybody in this room or outside of it who thinks that circling the wagons is somehow aligned with the actual God we have. Widening the circle, no, that's a different story. And so we want to take seriously what Jesus took seriously, and those were four things. Inclusion, nonviolence, unconditional loving kindness, and compassionate ex acceptance. And then suddenly something breaks through, a new sense of the kind of God we have. Um, the homies are always uh, helping me understand, you know, uh, this God, usually by mangling the English language, I, which I always find kind of illuminating and... Uh, 
Uh, I remember a homegirl came into my office and she wanted to introduce her man to me. And he had come to pick her up at the end of the day. She was a trainee, a gang member. And she said, this is my sufficient other. <laughs> I said, no doubt. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I have a CEO now who runs the place, so it's nice. It's a large operation, homeboy, $20 million. And so I'm happy not to have to worry. I do, but I don't have to about... Um, meeting payroll and such, he can do that. And so at home, he came into my office and um, kind of distressed and a trainee. And he said, damn, gee, my lady's in a bad mood today. And I said, why? And he said, well, you know, she's beginning her administration period. <laughs> and I said, well, I just finished mine. So uh, <laughs> I kind of know what she's going through. And, but my favorite one uh, happened when I was uh, preaching and presiding at uh, San Fernando Juvenile Hall in a big gym, like 500 kids. And, and uh, you know, I was vested, my album I stole, and I had the little hoja that was on my lap, and it had the readings in English and Spanish. And I thought, well, I'm just going to close it and close my eyes and listen to the word proclaimed. And, um, you know, the homies got up to do the readings. One, the first homie did the first reading, and then the, and then the responsorial psalm. Uh, the guy got up, and I had my eyes closed, and it, there, he had sort of an overabundance of confidence. Uh, and he got up, and he said, The Lord is exhausted. <laughs> and I looked at the sheet, what the hell? <laughs> and it was, The Lord is exalted. And I remember thinking at the time, wow, that's way better. <laughs> because the exalted God, if, if we're honest with ourselves, the exalted God is a creation, is a projection. It's, you know, we create God in our own image. There isn't anybody in this room or outside of it who wouldn't want to be exalted if you were God. That's how that works. But the exhausted God is kind of generous and humble, and, and it's not about him. It's about us. That is a better God than the one we have. I think it's important to kind of fine tune these things. My friend Anne Lamott always says, you know you've created God in your own image when God hates the same people you do, you know? <laughs> and that's, you know, probably a good thing to keep, because the more we can be in the world who God is, compassionate, loving, kind, imagine what would happen as we widen the circle. I uh, buried my mom uh, a year ago, and uh, she was 92 years old and had eight kids. And I had buried my father like 25 years ago, and um, and she died in her own home, which is pretty nice, and with her kids all around her. And she um, wasn't one bit afraid of dying, you know. In fact, a couple of weeks before she died, she said, "I've never done this before," you know. And, <laughs> And it was like something you might say at, just before skydiving, you know? And, and in fact, the, her last words to me were the day before she died. And she was asleep, and I happened to be alone with her. And, and she opens her eyes, and she sees me, and she goes, oh, for crying out loud. And she goes back to sleep. Well, she was pissed off that she was still alive, you know? And <laughs> sorry. But the next day, uh, again, as luck would have it, my sister's about getting lunch, and I was sitting by her bedside, and uh, she let out this glorious, wondrous gasp, and she left us. And nobody in earshot of that sound would ever fear death again. But a thing she did with all her kids, you know, it would be two, three, eight of us standing around her bed. She'd be in and out of consciousness, but when she... When she woke up, she'd lock on to one of us and she'd say, you're here, you're here. And I remember after burying her, I thought, ah, I think that's the solitary agenda item of our God, our God who doesn't want anything from us, only for us, who only wants to look at us and say, you're here. I think that matters. Because otherwise, we're going to go down a rabbit hole of issues. And we don't ever get at them anyway. Everything's about something else. 
Gang violence is about a lethal absence of hope and it's about pain and trauma and damage so intense and unspeakable. And it's about mental health and mental illness. But if you think it's about bad guys who need to have their behavior altered, yikes. We want to be sophisticated about these things, you know? Everything's about something else. And you somehow want to address the right things. Even like hate, you know, I, I, there was a Jesuit university that, you know, started a course on hate. And, you know, I don't know. Really? You think it's about hate? You know, if somebody guns down a bunch of people at a synagogue or, I don't know, I think it's about health. I'm going to go with mental illness, but you go ahead and go with hate. But what happens is it's demonizing. It's, I am not this person, and he does not belong to me. And until we think Dylan Roof belongs to us, we're not going to make any progress. You can talk about every policy, legislative thing that you wish to do, and, and you'll reach back and you'll pat yourself, and we've addressed this head on. Yeah, nothing's head on, ever. Things are always about something else. You know, at Homeboy Industries, people can act in alarming ways, but we never get tripped up by behavior because we always know violence, gang violence, and all behavior is a language. What language is it speaking? If it's the language of despair, then how do you infuse hope to people for whom hope is foreign? If it's the language of trauma, how do you help people transform their pain so they don't have to transmit it anymore? If it's the language of mental illness, how do we deliver mental health services in a timely and culturally appropriate way? But kinship to me is the answer. Uh, unless there's this connective tissue born of tenderness, which is the highest form of spiritual maturity. Otherwise, love stays in the air or in our hearts or in our heads, but unless it becomes tender, there's nothing that connects us to each other. And that's God's dream come true, that you may be one. How do you obliterate once and for all the illusion that we are separate? Even in service, I think this is a thing that, that you know, we, we need to address even in our institutions because there's a distance in service. Service provider, service recipient. How do we bridge even that, you know? How do we arrive at this exquisite mutuality where there is no daylight that separates us? So one of the great privileges of my life was knowing Cesar Chavez as a friend and, and uh, he was just the best listener I've ever been in the presence of. If you were talking to him, nobody else existed. He was laser beam focused. He was never looking over your shoulder to see if someone more important was on the approach. Yeah, I wish I could pull that off, you know. He, he kind of received who you were. He allowed himself to be reached by you. But once a, a reporter uh, had asked him, uh, wow, you know, these farm workers, they sure love you. And Cesar just shrugged and smiled and said, the feeling's mutual, which of course is the whole point. How do we arrive at that moment where, where where there's nothing that keeps us from each other. Uh, you know, on Saturdays and Sundays, I'm on a rotating basis, I say mass in all these detention facilities. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, in the mornings, and a lot of them are quite far. And then uh, because I've been at Dolores Mission in that community for 33 years, I get asked to do things. You know, homies will ask me to, baptize, and, and my, my Saturdays always look the same. One o'clock baptism, two o'clock quinceanera, where a girl turns 15, three o'clock wedding, four o'clock exorcism. 
just checking to see if you're still listening to me. I've never done one of those, but so I remember racing back uh, many, many years ago, and it was like 20 minutes to one, and I had a one o'clock baptism, and the homies were never on time, so I thought, well, I got time to go to my storefront office and pick up the mail, so I'm going through the mail, and, um, and I'm just contento, feliz, you know, sitting there by myself reading the mail, when all of a sudden this woman walks in, her name is Lisa, and uh, this is the first time she's ever stepped foot in my office. And, you know, she's kind of well known on First Street. She's a prostitute. She's a heroin addict. She's a gang member. She's a felon. The homies uh, used to call her La Gritona because she's always screaming. She would scream at the guy who owns the bar next door and because like clockwork, he'd toss her out every day. She'd scream into a payphone on First Street, just let me stay tonight, pleading with family members and friends. And this is the first time she's ever stepped foot in my office, and, and I'm looking at my watch, and now it's 10 minutes to my 1 o'clock uh, baptism. And she comes into my office, and she sort of surveys all the photographs, and she plunks herself down. She launches right in. I need help. Oh, I've been to like 50 rehabs. I'm known all over, nationwide. Went to Catholic schools all my life, she said. Graduated from elementary. I even graduated from Sacred Heart High School in Lincoln Heights. And then she gets quiet and, and still. And she said, in fact, First time I ever used heroin was right after I graduated. And I've been trying to stop since the moment I began. And she leaned her head against the wall behind her, and her eyes became like two ponds, water rising to meet its edges and spilling over. And she cried, and she cried, and I let her cry. Till finally she leveled her gaze at me and she said with great deliberation, I am a disgrace. And suddenly her shame met mine. Because when I had seen her step into my office that afternoon, I had mistaken her for an interruption. Mother Teresa diagnosed the world's ills correctly, I think, when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. How do we stand against forgetting that? How do we move to a place where the circle widens and nobody's left outside? I remember uh, Whoopi Goldberg was interviewed in, I think, Vanity Fair, a little Q&A, and, and they asked her, name a living person you most admire. And very quickly she says, Pope Francis. And then she adds this, yeah, he's going with the original program. <laughs> well, and everybody knows what the original program is. It's about living as though the truth were true. It's about putting first things recognizably first. St. Francis of Assisi, in a troubled time in the church, didn't address the troubled time in his church. He rolled up his sleeves and he embraced the marrow of the gospel and found the joy there. And it reignited the church because it was the original program. Everybody knows what it is. This is why it's important not to go to the margins and try to make a difference. I had a homie in uh, Houston uh, who works with gang members and came up to me after a talk and pleaded with me. And he said, how do you reach them? Meaning gang members. I said, well, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? 
And I think that's the stance of the original program. And the original, original program is the covenantal relationship where God says, as I have loved you, the God that we create in our own image would say, now love me back. But that's not what this God says, the God we actually have. As I have loved you, so must you have a special preferential care and love for the widow, orphan, and the stranger. And God has identified these three subgroupings of the poor because God thinks these are the folks who know what it's like to have been cut off. And because they have suffered in this particular way, God thinks these are the folks who happen to be our trustworthy guides to lead the rest of us to the kinship of God. I think it's how it's supposed to work, that we follow, that we listen, that we allow ourselves to be reached, that we delight in the people who are in front of us, and we allow ourselves to be evangelized by the poor. It's different than taking the right stand on issues. It's always about standing in the right place. And the soul feels its worth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Yeah, it's about Jesus and yeah, it's about Christmas, but how is it not the job description of everyone in this room? You appear and the soul feels its worth. All of us are called to be enlightened witnesses, people who through your kindness and tenderness and focused, attentive love return people to themselves. For the principal suffering of the poor throughout history and throughout scripture is shame and disgrace. How do you dismantle those messages? And how do you in turn allow yourself to be reached by people? And how do you embrace the highest form of spiritual maturity, tenderness. Because only the soul that ventilates the world with tenderness has any shot of change in the world anyway. I remember I was uh, sitting at my desk and I was talking to uh, four potential donors. And if you've been to Homeboy Industries, you know my office is glass so I can see out. And um, trying to get some money out of these donors to help them support Homeboy. And, and I look up in the, in the reception area, is just teeming with gang members. And so I, my eye catches this homie who's come in. I know he's a gang member, but I don't know who he is. And he's kind of moving erratically, and he has a soda can. And with every punctuation mark, the soda is flying out onto these very uh, nervous, uh, awkward homies who are sitting in what we call the well, the reception desk. And I go, so I know right away this is a combo burger of meth and madness. So I, I start to get up to kind of deal with it when I see Miguel Lugo, who's uh, the head of our security detail, and he's a homie who spent 18 years in prison. Half of those years were in solitary confinement. He's the biggest vato who's ever worked at Homeboy. He's just huge. And I see him put his arm around this guy and he escorts him outside and I asked him about it later. And when they get outside, the guy, the meth madness guy, lifts his shirt, <laughs> revealing a gun tucked into the front of his pants. And then he drops the shirt. And Miguel says, how about you and me, we walk down right now to Alvera Street, and I'll buy you some tacos. And the guy lifts his shirt again, revealing the gun. He says, how about I put a bullet in your head? And he drops the shirt. And Miguel looks at him and says, two tacos or three? And the guy agrees to walk down the street, down Alameda towards Alvera Street. And Miguel tells me the guy is kind of having conversations with the voices in his head, but they're leaping out of his mouth like a bunch of frogs, you know, and shoot his ass. No, he's okay. You can't trust him. He's buying me tacos like this all the way down the street. 
So they get to Alvera Street and, and Miguel buys them three tacos and, and the guy takes the first taco and he throws it to the ground, no doubt feeding the voices in his head that have been tormenting him. And then he just inhaled the other two tacos because the truth, he's a hungry human being. And only the soul that ventilates the world with tenderness has any chance of healing and changing and transforming the world. The Buddhists uh, begin a lot of the writings by saying, Oh, nobly born, remember who you truly are. We transformed ourselves a lot at Homeboy Industries from beginning with jobs and nothing stops a bullet like a job. But then we realized it was really about healing and connection. It was really about kinship and solidarity with each other. It really was about inclusion, nonviolence, unconditional loving kindness and compassionate acceptance. It really was about taking seriously what Jesus took seriously. It was about the original program. And that's what you hope for. Ours is a God who waits, who are we not to? Homeboy Industries is not for those who need help, it's only for those who want it, so they have to walk through the door, otherwise it doesn't work. But once they do, they're surrounded by a care and a tenderness and a love where folks feel like they're wearing parachutes. Everyone who walks through our doors comes with a history of unspeakable things having been done to them. And they come with like a big old backpack filled with chronic toxic stress. And unless they can find relief, you can't deliver any services to them anyway. So then they find a sanctuary and then they become the sanctuary that they sought. And then they go home and provide that sanctuary to their kids and you've broken a cycle. Oh, nobly born. We try to remind the homies of the truth of who they are, their truth self in loving, so that they can rest in the stillness of love, and then they can love in the stillness of God, the God we actually have, not the one that we've settled for. So years ago, I would ride my bike in the middle of the night, and I'd see this guy, Bandit. We all called him Bandit, and he was... Uh, a bandit, you know, he was a gang member and sold drugs and into his gang and he would run up to cars and sell crack cocaine and then I would, uh, you know, offer for the umpteenth time, how about a real job? And he always was very kind and polite and I'm okay, G, thanks though. Until one day he came into Homeboy Industries and I couldn't believe my eyes and he said what gang members often say, I'm tired of being tired. So he began working at, at Homeboy and uh, he got a dose of what we call uh, uh, the tenderness and he was received by people. As the homies there who run the place say, we, we don't save you, we see you. And certainly homies are used to being watched but they're not used to being seen. And then he moved on from Homeboy after his 18 months were over and we got him a job, entry level job in a warehouse. Then cut to years later, he was uh, El Mero Chingon, the head of the whole damn warehouse. He was supervisor, married, home, uh, you know, kids. And I hadn't heard from him in a really long time and one uh, Friday he calls me and kind of with a panic in his voice, he said, gee, you got to bless my daughter. ¿Qué pasó, mijo? Is she sick? Is she in the hospital? And he says, no, no, on Sunday she's going to Humboldt College. Imagine my oldest, my Jessica, she's going to college. 
But Humboldt's way up north, it's far, and she's a little chaparita, and we're nervous for, do you think you could give her a blessing b before she leaves? And I said, my gosh, are you kidding? I'd be honored to do it. I mean, tomorrow's Saturday. I have an exorcism at 1, so um, <laughs> why don't you come at 12.30, and we'll do a little send-off. And so, sure enough, uh, Bandit and his wife and the three kids, including tiny little Jessica, heading to college, show up. And it's just us in the church. And I said, well, let's stand in front of the altar and let's put Jessica in the middle. Everybody surround her. Everybody touch her. Everybody put your hands on her shoulder, on her head. Go ahead, touch her, everybody. And we bow our heads and I close my eyes. We all close our eyes. And as the homies would say, I do a long ass prayer. You know, I go on and on. And and somewhere in the middle of this prayer, I noticed that we've all become chiones, you know, we're all, <laughs> we're all just blubbering, you know, and, and I don't know why we're crying exactly, except for the fact that Bandit and his wife don't know anybody who's ever gone to college except me, certainly nobody in their families. So, you know, we finish and we wipe away our tears and, and we're all kind of laughing at how mushy we got, and so I, I look at and Jessica trying to change the subject. Hey, what are you going to study at Humboldt College? She was very quick, forensic psychology. And I go, damn, forensic psychology. <laughs> and Bandit chimes in and said, yeah, she's going to study the criminal mind. <laughs> and Jessica turns and looks at her father, and she does one of these, you know. And, and he sees her and laughs and says, yeah, I'm going to be her first subject. So we walk outside and big abrazos, everybody piles in the car, but Bandit hangs back and I'm glad he has. And I, I said, hey, can I tell you something? I give you credit for the man you've chosen to become, for choosing to walk in your own footsteps. I'm proud of you. And his eyes well up with tears and he says, sabes que? I'm proud of myself. All my life, people called me a low life, a bueno para nada, a good for nothing. I guess I showed them. I said, yeah, I guess you did. And the soul feels its worth. Oh, nobly born, don't forget who you really are. No kinship, no peace. No kinship, no justice. No kinship, no equality. And I suspect if creating a community of kinship happened to be our goal, we would no longer be promoting justice, we'd be celebrating it. And pretty soon we cease to care if anyone accuses us of wasting our time. For in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And so we choose to make those voices heard because it's the original program. Thank you all very much. I have to say, first off, that uh, I first heard about you, Greg, when I was sent a vocation video. Uh, it was on VHS. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> and it featured you, and you were telling a story about, uh, on that video, well, you were telling your own vocation story. And, and you were also telling a story about one of the homies who would say to you that when all, all these white folks would come by home, Homeboy Industries, and they would always say, this is great. What's going on here is great, right? 
Um, and that's always stuck with me because it's something I say all the time. And that was great, is really what I was, where I was going with this. <laughs> that was really great. <laughs> well, um, I agree with you, I, and not just because I'm the editor of a magazine, but uh, <laughs> words matter. Words matter. And what I like about this word healing is it's, it's not about solving, right? Because if it were about solving, then we'd be talking about issues. But here, we're talking about healing, which is something else. It's something that's deeper. And, and you alluded to this. It's something that, you, also, that you, you, you almost first have to allow to happen to yourself, isn't it? In, 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 uh, otherwise, the, the, if you think of yourself as bringing healing or bringing justice or bringing mercy to people, you can, you can sometimes unwittingly even do violence to them. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think um, at, at Homeboy we always uh, have kind of this way of measuring. We always say, don't be a stranger to yourself. Because unless you make friends with your own wound, you're going to be tempted to despise the wounded. And, and that rears its head all, all over the place at Homeboy sometimes. So you have to kind of put people on check. So where did that come from? And why is that bothering you so much? And why are you taking that personally? Which is why it's so important, uh, you know, the world gets tripped up by behavior and at Homeboy we don't want to be. We want to we wanna get underneath it. What is this indicating? You know, like in uh, 19th century medical history when they had all these vexing diseases, they didn't know exactly what to do. And they applied everything they knew to apply, you know, doctors, hospitals, nurses, medicine. Nothing was working until quite inadvertently over here somebody discovered the water supply in the sewer system and they, they dealt with that. And all the diseases over here dis disappeared because the diseases were about something else. And I was just, before I came over here, I was uh, on a radio show for Ch in Chicago because I'm going to be there in a week or something. And and, and Chicago has a lot of vexing, violent issues, you know, but again, everybody is, everybody is self-congratulatory because we will address this head on. Good luck with that. Because the, the trick is really to find the something else, to find the water supply in the sewer system that you can deal with. That will have impact way over here. And I think just about anything that we deal with as a church it's always about something else. And that's kind of a challenge. Uh, and so you don't want to get stuck in old kind of, uh, you know, uh, here we are in Lent, and repent means to move beyond the mind you have. And we all need to do that in an evolving way where our consciousness grows, where, we're, where we don't want to settle for unsophisticated uh, black and white dualistic thinking, as you, as you might uh, call it. And so you want to be able to somehow get underneath things, because if you can identify how God sees just about everything, God gets underneath things. God knows that people are carrying things. So how, how can we stand in awe at what people have to carry rather than stand in judgment? at how they carry it. There's, a, there's almost a breaking down that has to happen first, right? There's a way in which like, grace or whatever it is, that, that, that radical force of God breaking into our lives, it, it, it kind of scandalizes us, right? I mean, I was thinking about recently, uh, when I was getting ready to see you, I was thinking about this reading of the um, uh, that Rene Girard, this French-American thinker, gives us about the Gerasene demoniac. And he points out in that that it's not until the, the, the demoniac is put back into his right mind that the people become afraid, right? Because they were, uh, and you alluded to this in your talk, they were very heavily invested in this person being other, of not being one of us, right? We are not that guy, right? right. And there's something that, something that has to break through to break that down, isn't there? Yeah. Well, demonizing is always untruth. And, uh, and you can't demonize people you know. And so part of, I think, the hope is always to put ourselves in the vicinity of, 
of other people, especially people who are frightened of her. That's kind of the whole point and the magic of Homeboy Industries is that, like we have 300 volunteers, you know, and, and uh, I remember once a woman came and she was quite insistent on volunteering there. In fact, she said, I have to volunteer at Homeboy Industry. I go, Yikes. <laughs> why do you have to volunteer at Homeboy Industry? She goes, I think I have a message these young people need to hear. And I said, yikes. <laughs> I, I said, do me a favor, the minute you lose that message, I hope you come back to us, you know? Because I don't want your message. You know, you want people to come and can you receive people? Uh, where did you do theology? In London. Oh, in London. Yeah. At, at Heathrow. Uh, at Heathrow, yeah. yeah. Of happy memory. Yeah, yeah that's right. I, I lived there in, uh, on a sabbatical in that Jesuit community. Um, but I was at Weston, in, Weston School of Theology in Cambridge, and you could take all these courses, a bunch of places. So I took a course uh, taught by, team taught by Henry Nowen yeah. and Parker Palmer at Harvard. And it was a course on ministry. And I remember Henry Nowen wasn't having such a, a good day. You know, he was sort of, uh, he didn't like Harvard and he left there shortly thereafter. I think he did one semester. But it was a course on ministry and somebody asked him, what is ministry? And he just said, can you receive people? And it's the only thing I remember from that class because I think, because <laughs> I think it, he was exasperated and, and it really was about receiving people. And I thought, yeah, that's kind of how, that's how it is. That's the way it's supposed to be, you know, and that's how the healing happens. Uh, but everything is dependent on our diagnosis. You know, if you're, nobody's ever met a, a healthy treatment plan that was born of a bad diagnosis. And then things change forever, you know. So once you know what epilepsy is, you will never think again, as Jesus did, that the guy having the seizures in the scripture, in the gospel, was possessed by a demon. No, it was epilepsy. Even today, I mean, I, I find these things kind of thrilling, you know. The gospel today is the pick up your mat and walk. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus has this odd line where he says, sin no more to avoid worse things happening to you. And you go, yikes, Jesus, no, don't say that. <laughs> I mean, because everybody, Jesus and the people of his time, all thought if you were disabled, you had done something, or your parents had done something wrong, or your grandparents had sinned, and this was what happened. But everybody thought that then. But we don't think that now. Once you kind of know all sorts of things, like science and epilepsy. Like, I recommend a book uh, by Nadine uh, Harris Burke, or Burke Harris. And it's, a, it's a, a book about trauma and about the ACE study. You know what the ACE study is? The um, adverse childhood experiences, and there are 10 checkpoints. And, um, you know, uh, parents who were mentally ill, sexual abuse, violence, um, neglect, uh, divorce. I mean, there are all these things, 10. And, you know, if you're high on the ACE study, then, you know, the chances are, it, she makes the case about health physical health, you know, you're, you'll have physical, you know, heart problems or whatever. But at Homeboy Industries, every single person who walks through those doors is somewhere in the nine or 10 checklist. Now, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, the wonderful parents and wonderful siblings. I can't muster one from that list of 10. And so once you know the ACE study, for example, well then, now what does it tell you about choice or free will or sin? Not all choices are created equal. I was born and raised in the gang capital of the world, but I didn't join a gang, not because I was, I'm morally superior to the homies I'm privileged to walk with, 
but because I won all these lotteries, parent lottery, zip code lottery, sibling lottery, Jesuit education lottery. You joined the Jesuits. Yeah. But, and, but there is a sense in which, like, there, when they joined a gang, they were sort of looking for the same kind of thing that you were looking for when you joined the Jesuits. No, because no, right no, no, no kid is seeking anything when he joins a gang. He's always fleeing something. Always. No exceptions. No exceptions. I've never met the exception, and you think I might have in 33 years of working with gang members. Gangs are the places kids go when they want to die. Gangs are the places kids go when, when, when their life is a misery, and misery loves company. So, you know, we stand back, and don't they know the difference between right and wrong? And, and we do that kind of demonizing, and we have a prison system that will accommodate all that demonizing. But, uh, wow, you know, I would not have survived the childhood of just about anybody who works at Homeboy Industries. And their stories, if they were flames, you'd have to keep your distance, otherwise you'd get scorched because they're so intense and yet extraordinary sense of grace and dignity that they inhabit in, in your presence. So, I mean, we evolve and we know things and we know that disabled people aren't the result of sin. We know this, but Jesus didn't know that and, and his audience didn't know that and he didn't know what epilepsy was so I don't know everybody said this guy's possessed by a demon no well here's a pill that'll control your seizures I think that's sort of thrilling because it means we grow and, and our consciousness gets deeper and we know more today than we did yesterday and if your notion of God in the third grade isn't the same one you have currently and if that's true, why wouldn't your notion of God be different 10 minutes from now? And that's exciting, I think. Why would it stay the same? And, and it's the thing that keeps us anchored in our true selves in loving. I don't know how you can get to it unless you can rest uh, in this God. Uh, who loves us without measure and without regret. So I have no idea where all that came from right now, but. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, no, it's great. The, I mean, the, the, I, I guess you were saying like, you know, we have evolved to a point where we don't say, well, this person has epilepsy because they are sinners or their parents were sinners. And I think that that's true. But there is a kind of way in which we still other people in, you know, I, I might be tempted, say, when I'm walking outside the 7-Eleven, I see a homeless person, and I'm like, you know, well, that guy made all these really bad choices, or he had terrible parents, right? And it's, in other words, it's really his fault, or his yeah. parents' fault that he's there, right? Which, A, kind of absolves me of any kind of responsibility for him, and also, it, it, it means that I'm, I'm far away from ever being that guy, right? because it's scary to think that I might be closer to being that guy than, than I think. And this is why I think kinship is the whole nine yards. You know, radical kinship is what, what Jesus, the only thing that mattered for Jesus, that you be one, that there be no sense of us and them, and that we belong to each other. And so the more you can inch closer to that, this is why, and Gerard does a lot about this too, you know, it's, you know, how do, how, do you, how do you move yourself closer to awe yeah. and take giant steps away from judgment? Because it's judgment that keeps us from each other. And separation is an illusion, but we live out of that, that I am not that person. And he does not belong to us. I remember there was a shooting uh, at a high school in, in Texas. And I can remember, I don't, NPR, I was listening to something, and Ted Cruz it was asked to comment on this shooting that had just happened. And he said, evil has visited this town. 
And then they cut to a 16-year-old girl who was a classmate who was there when the shooting happened and knew the shooter. And she said, you know, sometimes people walk around carrying a world of pain inside. Now, those, those are two separate kind of diagnoses and analysis. Yes. One is aligned with the God we actually have, and one, frankly, isn't. One is about kinship and the fact that we belong to each other and how can we embrace each other and see pain. You know, and, you know, the, the prodigal son story this past Sunday, you know, the father's running down the road and the kid is still a long way off and he doesn't see sin. He sees son. And, and that matters. And so it seems to me the more we can address that kind of thing, it feels like up in the sky. Yeah. But it has such impact on how we operate, how we deal with the folks on the margins. You know, Homeboy kind of wants to be the front porch of the world we all long to see, where no one is left out. And I think this is tough in the church, you know, because, you know, like with Francis, it's, he's embraced mercy, and, and he said, oh, mercy is who our God is, which, of course, is correct. And they always, fairly or not, kind of juxtapose, you know, Francis, mercy versus dogma. Yeah, kind of, you know, because dogma is circling the wagons and mercy is widening the circle. And the minute you start to say, well, what is more aligned with the God we have? Everybody knows the answer. And then you know that it's about love rather than fear. And, and, and do not be afraid in one form or another appears 365 times throughout Scripture. I'm going to think it's kind of important. You know, you got one of those for every day of the year. You know. Yeah, it's funny because when I, this basic intuition that you're talking about, which we all have about the program, as it were, the original program, is, um, you know, I would... I, I, over the years, I would get into a cab in New York, you know, and people would, had great love and respect for John Paul II, but nobody ever said to me, you know, the, the culture of death, the big thing associated with John Paul and his view of the world. And, or uh, with Benedict, it was the dictatorship of relativism, right? No cab driver ever uttered that phrase to me. But when I, I get into the cab and I'm wearing a collar today, you know, a Sikh will say, ah, who am I to judge? I like your pope, right? <laughs> Right, because everybody understands that. That's right. right. And they don't understand it because they're relativists, right? They understand it because they yeah. have basic intuition, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's important. And his first that. exhortation is called the joy of the gospel, not the thrill of being Catholic. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's a return right. somehow to the marrow, you know, uh, of, of what it is that, you know, I don't know, I find things kind of oddly exciting as much as people can be alarmed, you know? Like, uh, and, and this is controversial, I suppose, but, you know, the bishop in Kansas City about the same-sex couple who want to send their kid to a Catholic school. And fear and fear and fear and people are terrified and the pastor, you know, goes to the diocese and the diocese makes a statement and they say, no, we can't accept this kid, you know? And, you know, and then the bishop makes a big statement, you know, perfectly painstakingly aligned with the teaching of the church. And everybody and his mother protested and signed, you know, not just the prisoners, but all the parishes that surround it. And I, I go, yes, because God is inclusion. That's who God is. And that's an alarming development, it seems to me, because... Mm -hmm. You can say, is that perfectly aligned with the magisterium and the teaching? Of course, yeah. And does it line up with the God who wants to include? This is how Francis always says it. God wants to include. 
It's active. It's, it's not... It's, it's not for nothing that it's active. God wants to include. In the same way that Francis doesn't just talk about mercy. He talks about it as a verb, misericordiando. It doesn't even exist as a verb. Mercying. Yeah, right. mercying. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but I love it. You know, misori, misori, uh, misericordiando. It's, a, it's an active way of being. But that's a dilemma, it seems to me, because, because once you know the kind of God we have, then there can be no fear, and love drives out fear. And then you say, sure, of course we're going to educate this kid. Of course we are, because that's the kind of God we have. And that's a dilemma. I'll admit it's a dilemma, you know? And yet, I found it kind of thrilling that people went, no, that's not the God we have that says no. It just isn't. And if we want to take seriously what Jesus took seriously, well, then it has to mean those things. Inclusion, nonviolence, unconditional loving kindness, and compassionate acceptance. And that's the measure. That's how you measure. And it seems to me that they're probably part of the reaction that we would all be tempted to have in listening to you uh, is thinking, well, you know, but okay, those words, they sound great, but what do we actually do, right? And, but what you're saying, I think, which is so rooted in the gospel is if you don't, if, if, if you think that that's pablum, or you think that those are just cliches, then we really don't know what the words mean, do we? But you don't want there to be a disconnect from what, how we live and what we say. This is why St. Francis of Assisi, Assisi was so radical, because he just wanted to live as though the truth were true, and that that would reconnect us to the joy of the gospel. And in the end, it's about joy. My joy, yours, your joy complete. And that's what Francis is inviting us to. That's the original program. I, I don't envy him because, you know, I was just in Rome. And, and remember how Martin Luther used to say, you can't stay in Rome too long because you're going to lose your faith, you know? And it's like, yikes! <laughs> and I couldn't get out of there fast enough. And it's like, it's just so steep in clericalism. And it's like, and you just go, wow, what are we doing? And, and somehow you want to just... Uh, return, you know, but sometimes we don't return back enough, you know, we want to return to 1954, which is a good year, I was born that year, but no, <laughs> go back farther, you know, where, where the early Christian community, you know, They were just marked by a whole other way of living. It wasn't about a belief system. It was about a way of living. They called it the way. Yeah. And, and, and that's, you know, have we lost that? Of course. Can we regain that? Of course we can. Because that's the original program. And, and everybody knows what it is. Even the frightened people. I think we have some uh, microphones. We're, we're going to circulate here because we have some time for some questions. And uh, while we're queuing, queuing up or what have you, the um, uh, w w one thing that also uh, I, I really enjoyed about your talk, Greg, was when you said that the, it's always about something else. There's always something else, right? It's always, and that seems to me to resonate so. It resonated so much with me because that's what the gospel is always telling us, right? Jesus is always saying, no, 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 you all think it's this, but it's that. That's right. You all think it's this, but it's that, right? There's a wonderful story in Stephen Oates' biography of Martin Luther King Jr. when uh, one of his uh, civil rights activists, a young man, turns to him and says, why are we doing all of this, you know, just so we could sit at this lunch counter and eat a grilled cheese sandwich with these folks? And King says to him, is that what you think this is about? It's about something else. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, how are you? 
Hi, I'm well, thank you. My name's Lindsay, thank you so much. Um, I read your first book. Uh, Juan Carlos uh, Munoz gave me the book. And in there was a question that I wanted to ask you. You make references to how poverty affects uh, the community. Could you speak about that a little bit more? Well, I, you know, there's a great disparity between the haves and the have-nots in terms of access to those things that enhance our lives, you know, education, health care, opportunities in general. And I always feel that, you know, because now I've lived most of my life on the east side of Los Angeles, you know, and, and even though I, you know, I spent 18 years, I guess, uh, raised on the other side of town, and it's just uh, not equal. And it has nothing to do with hardworking or smart or has nothing to do with any of that stuff. It's just sheer dumb luck that threw me in one zip code as opposed to another. So once people know that, and that's part of the othering that Matt was talking about, you know, we, you know, <laughs> pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, you know. Um, hard work and and it's also the myth of people who are wealthy and powerful and successful none of them will say sheer dumb luck they're gonna say hard work i'm smart you know and that doesn't mean they're not smart or not hard working but the largest piece of the pie is just is sheer dumb luck and so we're all born wanting the same things. And uh, a homie said to me once, I wasn't born a slave, but I was born into slavery. And he had a sense of kind of, you know, he grew up in the projects and, and the homies can kind of romanticize the projects. And I get that because I, I do too sometimes. Place of community and connection and women hanging up their laundry and people laughing and, you know, but it was, it was so appreciably different from the community where I grew up. And, and people were just exposed to horrible things and it's, uh, and it's not just empty bank accounts. It's, it's a precariousness that's really quite um, chilling and debilitating. And if we believe that the poor belong to us in the sense of we are connected as members of the human family, then we'll look at things differently and we'll look at systems and we'll look at how people stay poor and, and how, you know, especially now in this country, such a tiny percentile of people, you know, uh, reap you know, the benefits of, of, of this country. And, and the poor are left out. So leaving nobody out and widening the circle uh, so that there's nobody standing outside of it, and that includes poverty and, and, uh, and an equitable way of, of sharing our resources as a family. So poverty certainly is the undergirding issue with gang violence. But underneath all that, you know, people have to carry a great deal uh, because it's just plain difficult uh, growing up on, on certain, in certain parts of this city than in others. So, but the more we can cross boundaries and then kind of put ourselves again in the vicinity of folks who struggle, uh, all that's a game changer because you can't hang on to your demonizing point of view if you know people, which is why we encourage, you know, folks to come to Homeboy just to kind of hang out and listen and have people tell them their stories. And so all that matters, I think. It's hard, it's hard to hate on people you, you know. That's you know, right. But... You can't do it. And, and because we have rival enemy gang members who work side by side with each other, they don't work stuff out in as much as they talk to each other and say, hey, remember that time you shot at me? Well, that pissed me off, you know, and, 
<laughs> no, they don't work stuff. Richard Rohr says that women, he says, um, work things out face to face, but men work things out shoulder to shoulder. Mm. That may or may not be true, but I, I it, especially with women, I, I don't know if that's exactly true, but, but it's true with the homies. I mean, they, they work stuff out shoulder to shoulder and, um, and, and it's just because in each other's vicinity, you recognize that we are not different. We all were born wanting the same things and people discover that. Are we overstaying our welcome? Yeah, I think we have time for one, one, one or two more. If we have them. I have a question about kids. Um, I used to teach high school kids, freshmen and sophomores. And, um, and I taught in a pretty privileged school. I taught in a Jesuit Catholic school in New York City. And uh, our demographic of student wasn't, um, wasn't too poor. Um, there were few and far between in that particular school. And I hear you loud and clear about standing with. And that's, that's crucial, you know. Um, what kind of advice would you give students who are in some places that maybe they're not um, close to or connected to people who, who are other? Um, and what advice, that, that, what advice could you give them if they don't naturally see somebody as other, but they're there? And, and, and how, to, how to work through those things in those particular places, whether they're privileged high schools or colleges or neighborhoods, or you know, how could they move to, to, to embracing people who are, who are other? Yeah, I, I think it's a really an admirable thing that happens in our high schools, the Jesuit high schools, you know, and, and the whole notion of men and women for and with others. Um, but it's a, it's a tough thing, you know, you have to acknowledge that service is, is where you start. It's the hallway that gets you to the ballroom. You got to get to the ballroom, which is the place of exquisite mutuality and kinship. So, you know, every, every year for probably the last 15 years, we, we have three or four seniors from Loyola High School in it. Loyola, the seniors take the month of January off and they go do immersion in service, which is really good. But we always have three or four. And, and the, the seniors always say the same thing to me. They come in, they meet with me, and what are we going to do here, you know? <laughs> and I always say, no, wrong question. What's going to happen to you here? Because you always want to avoid the doing part. Because it's, and it's not like, you know, build the orphanage in Tecate. I get that. But this is like, no, what's going to happen to you? So we try to, they'll find something, that we'll find something for them to do eventually. But that's secondary to the relationship because the relationship is the thing that he heals. And it's mutual. Everyone gets returned to themselves. Nobody's left out of that. And once it's, once you're allowing yourself to be reached by people, especially those on the margins, then it's mutually ennobilizing. You know, everybody's inhabiting their dignity and their nobility in each other's presence. It's not a thing that you bestow on that person. And invariably, it always works. You know, they'll leave and then they'll come back because it's been relational. And everybody's returned to their own relational wholeness. And, and that's what you hope for. But it's never a thing of service provider, service recipient. You know, it's, you cast your lot. And, uh, and then you're, you're friends, you're in relationship. And, and that's the game changer. That, that's what will alter these kids forever. Rather than, I went to Homeboy Industries and I did X, Y, and Z, and I feel pretty good because I made a difference. No, you don't want that. And that's kind of the next frontier, it seems to me, where we can be more humble in what we receive from, from the poor. Yeah, there was, it seems to me that that's a very Ignatian way of going about things because uh, I remember as a novice being bucked down in a village in the middle of South America and the priest I was shadowing um, for the eight weeks I was there, he wouldn't let me do anything. I just had to be there. 
And it was, it, and it was precisely because my instinct was I'm going to do something which was unconsciously a way of like setting up a barrier between me and these people because I was scared. I'm scared to meet them, I'm scared to be vulnerable. Right? Yeah. Well, this has been great. Uh, <laughs> it's been absolutely wonderful. You're absolutely free. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I will claim it as my own. Um, and I'm also I'm, I'm delighted to say that uh, you know we uh, American Media has a marketplace on our website at AmericanMedia.org um, where we feature uh, Jesuit swag, um, <laughs> which is uh, which is uh, really cool. I'm probably not cool enough to wear it, but you all are. <laughs> And um, it's a partnership that we have with Homeboy Industries, and uh, we couldn't be more pleased than, uh, than, than to be partners with you. And and very grateful that uh, you're my brother, and grateful for this work, and thank you for being here tonight, Greg. Thank you. <laughs>